Today, the Australia Post Inquiry D-Day. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, this coming Tuesday, the 13th of April, there's going to be a Senate Inquiry public hearing into the Australia Post Inquiry. This is the inquiry which was resulting from the Christine Holgate affair, the Watches affair, if you've been following our posts, and it's really coming to quite an interesting head. The fact of the matter is that the inquiry, which was open until the 13th of March, received overall 22 submissions, and my own submission there is included, as well as submissions from Christine Holgate, the CEO at the time, as well as Australia Post, and a few others too. But the point I wanted to make today was that this is a very important inquiry, not only because of the specific issues around Holgate, but more broadly, there are some wider issues to consider too. And in fact, I had a few people say to me, why are you spending time on this sideshow? It's not really important. Well, let me explain firstly why I think it is important. Firstly, it appears to me that Holgate was mistreated and handled very unfairly, both by the Board of Australia Post and by the government. In fact, the government, including the Prime Minister, it seems to me, overreacted. And they did it for certain reasons, which we'll come on to a second. So there's an equity question. Now, my second point is this. The local post offices are critical to the future success of towns and villages across the country. They are, in many cases, the last entity standing that provides commercial services to those local communities. When they disappear, after the banks have already gone, it can lead to a disastrous slide to oblivion. So the future of Australia Post's local offices is more than just a business decision for Australia Post. It is, frankly, important for the local communities. And the third point I want to make is that this, once again, lays bare the stupid systems and processes that work within our political settings, particularly in Canberra, where everything is seen as a game of chess, where everything is thought about in terms of winning and losing a particular argument, rather than doing the right thing for our community or our country. That's disgraceful, and it needs to be called out. So this is another opportunity to highlight the fact that things are not as they should be. The hearings are on the 13th of April, and I'll be watching from afar to see what happens. But before I go, I just wanted to highlight a couple of recent articles which really calls out the issues rather well. Terry McCran really went to town in The Australian, highlighting the fact that Australia Post's Christine Holger affair reflects badly on the government. He wrote, Treasurer and PM in waiting Josh Frydenberg is wrong, dead wrong. The government did not act appropriately over former Australia Post CEO Christine Holgate. In fact, the exact opposite is the truth. Everything the government has done in relation to Holgate has been utterly inappropriate and indeed at a more basic level both invalid and, well, just common or garden, but always just plain stupid. A word to the wise, he wrote. Just step away, Josh. Just step away. You don't have a dog in this fight. Leave it to the three of your colleagues who are up to their eyeballs in the mess that's been created. They are the PM, of course, who is, I love this, rumour has it, the tourism boss in waiting in Kazakhstan, now that Borat has moved on, and communications minister Paul Fletcher. The third is newbie finance minister Simon Birmingham, who got the hospital pass from Matthias Cormann, who had been the relevant minister 
on the relevant, all-important and faithful and now badly neglected day of October the 22nd last year. Corn is, of course, sunning himself in Western Australia, waiting to head for Paris and the succulent tax-free job, almost for life secured courtesy of the Australian taxpayer at a cost which the government refuses to disclose as head of the now utterly useless and indeed now even arguably malignant OECD. On the cost of securing that job for life for a mate, we can estimate that it would have been at least 50 times the $20,000 spent on those watches that so offends Scott Morrison and his lifelong concern for the taxpayer dollar. This last week, we've seen an eruption of she said, he said, and he said, he didn't say about those events on October the 22nd, the day of the ambush or sting. That was simply the ambush of Holgate, the sting of the government, and the all too stingable PM in particular, or to give him his official title from Bogan Buffet Central, ScoMo. On the part of the she said, this is perfectly understandable. She, if I can use Frydenberg's word appropriately, indeed very appropriately, feels humiliated, bad done by, abandoned, and just plain brutalised, all done totally inappropriately. I might add, for those involved, or just plain prurient, or indeed just genuinely interested, I have never met or spoken to the said she, Christine Holgate. However, it has had the unfortunate effect of diverting attention away from what actually happened on October the 22nd. In fact, and importantly, two things. The first is the brutalisation of Holgate. The second and this has been completely missed, is the sting which unfortunately the PM fell for hook, line and sinker. On October 22nd, Holgate got ambushed by Labour Senator Kimberly Kitchen over those infamous Cartnier watches. That led to everyone in and through Canberra quite literally losing their minds, except for the purpose of my point that the CEO of Australia Post handing out four watches with a total value of $20,000 as a thank you for four executives for sealing a deal that would deliver Australia Post $80 million plus every year was wrong. Did it really warrant the outrage? And did it warrant the step taken by both the PM and the chairman of Post, the effective immediate sacking of Holgate? Oh sure, they asked her to step aside while an inquiry was held into the watches. You have to be a complete idiot on the same level as PM and Chairman not to understand such a request sacked her. The Australian Chairman, in a clear breach of both his statutory responsibilities as a Chairman of Ospost and as a Chairman of any corporation, went along. And here's the point. Australia Post is a separate legal entity which operates under its own Act of Parliament. The two shareholding ministers, communications and finance, and only those two can make directions to the board. I doubt that any such direction in this matter would have been valid. With that aside, it's quite clear that they did not make any valid direction under the Act to order or even request her suspension as Ministers Fletcher and Cormann purported to do. Before making such a direction, they were required to consult with the OSPOS board, not with the chairman, but with the board. It is blindingly clear that there was no such consultation and they made no such direction, valid or invalid. The request to order to suspend Holgate was at least inappropriate and arguably completely invalid. It is telling in all but admission that both submissions to the Senate inquiry into this disgraceful affair from finance and communications made no reference at all to any such October 22nd direction. They did refer to the inquiry and only to that inquiry called by the ministers on that date and nothing more. Yet the Australia Post submission refers without comment and certainly no denial to the direction by the Minister for Communications to the Chair of Australia Post on the 22nd of October 2020 that the CEO of Australia Post, Christine Holgate, be stood down. So on what valid basis was Holgate asked, instructed, to stand down? Why didn't her chairman stand with her? 
and with the best interest of both Australia Post and the public against inappropriate and indeed invalid pressure from Canberra. Any such valid direction from the Minister to us Post has to be put before both Houses of Parliament within 15 sitting days. Where is it? What we had was a demand by a panicked, stung PM that Holgate stand aside. The Communications Minister demanding that the Chair of Australia Post utterly inappropriately folding like a cheap pack of cards. True, not surprisingly, as there isn't a spine between the eight invertebrates nominally directors of Australia Post. So what of Senator Kitchen, who ambushed Holgate and Morrison with detailed knowledge of the watches? How exactly did she get the information? He said, I suggest that pursuing the answers to that would bear very, very fruitful investigation. Kitchen, by the way, is a member of the Victorian right. Now, the second article was by Dennis Atkins in the New Daily. And he said, In just under 50 words late last October, Prime Minister Scott Morrison set an improvised explosive device for himself while thinking he was kicking goals for his natural constituency, that being white males who drive round trucks, carry a lick of grievance and love their sports. Confronted with the freshly exposed fat cat largesse of $5,000 cardio watches handed out to Australia Post executives by Chief Executive Christine Holgate, Morrison could not have been in higher dungeon. He was clearly loving himself, riding his elevated steed. I was appalled, he snarked when asked what he thought of Holgate's performance gifts to four executives who had saved small post offices from perilous times. It is disgraceful and it's not on. Morrison turned his blokey anger on Holgate. If the chief executive wishes to stand aside, well, not wishes to stand aside, she's been instructed to stand aside and she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. That she can go was delivered with the junkyard puffed up attitude we've seen before, although it's been absent lately as the Prime Minister musters whatever he can from the right side of his brain, dressed often in soft purple and mauve shirts. Not the uniform for a she can go or any day of the week lashing from the dispatch box, so the tone is being adjusted for newly scheduled transmission. Now it's respect and inclusion, although those here, let me explain these things, habit are hard to shake, as we saw when he sat between his chief female ministers, Rhys Payne, in charge of women, and Amanda Stoker, who has the job of assisting. In almost exquisite timing, Morrison was heading his new woman's cabinet at almost the very hour, former Australia Post Chief Holgate dropped a 154-page submission to a Senate committee looking at her very contentious Oster. During that what Holgate called the 10 most difficult and disappointing days of her career, beginning with the Senate Estimates Committee exposure of the watch's bonus and the Prime Ministerial demand that she go, the experienced senior executive sought medical help and was prescribed medication for her distraught state. While Holgate lays the predominance of blame for what she says was unlawful treatment at the feet of Australia Post chairman, it's clear that Australia Post ex-executive feels she was treated shabbily by the federal government, in particular Morrison and her portfolio minister, Paul Fletcher. Holgate also names Senator Leader Simon Birmingham, his Deputy and Women's Minister Maurice Payne and Health Minister Greg Hunt when saying she was disappointed in the lack of open support from many ministers whom I had worked with. Holgate has a very valid point and one that passes the pub test she says she was subjected to and made to fail. First, if Morrison had not unleashed his tirade against Holgate without knowing or thinking to ask about any of the details of the case, she would not have been bullied out of Australia Post, as she claims. Absent Morrison's unbridled outburst, the chairman could have handled the issue internally, had a review and released the very report that was actually issued, saying Holgate did nothing wrong. Instead, 
He had pressure from a prime minister who doesn't like not getting his way. It was unsustainable for the chairman and he buckled. His weak behaviour could be lost in a he said, she said Senate report due out later this month. It shouldn't be. Second, Morrison may well have acted the same against a male government agency chief who handed out seemingly generous gifts to executives. The counterfactual is not available, but the Prime Minister was keen on that day in October to divert attention from his government's negligent handling of aged care and his careless comment that if you're good at your job, you'll get a job. Holgate became collateral damage in self-preservation. However, it has had a ripple effect since. Many, but not all, senior business executives have been appalled, a few publicly, mainly privately, about Morrison's treatment of Holgate. A couple of key, very senior and usually centre-right media figures have been vigorous defenders of the ex-Australia Post executive. Most noted has been the experienced News Corp journalist Robert Gopston and Terry McCran, as well as radio and television host Alan Jones, who says Morrison bullied Holgate out of a job. Of these, McCran is most notable, a confidant of Rupert Murdoch, who has long sought the political and economic advice of the Melbourne Herald Sun veteran McCran, now calls Morrison ScoMo from Bogan Buffet Central. In a column this week, McCran doubled down on his prediction for Morrison's electoral fate. There is no way, no way the federal government is going to win the next election. What won it for ScoMo in 2019 was not his inherent brilliance or dodginess, but Pauline Hanson and Clive Palmer, with a little help from Bill Shorten. This kind of shouting from the conservative bleachers is why Morrison is pretending he had nothing to do with Holgate's demise. Asked this week about the issue, Morrison said, without a blink of embarrassment, this is a matter now that is substantively between Ms Holgate and Australia Post. And that's where I note the predominance of her comments have been directed. Ms Holgate decided to leave Australia Post. That's just a matter of record. Morrison never takes ownership for any mistake or misstep, error or aggrievous behaviour, action or attitude in anything but his scripted self-congratulatory announcements, he is the Prime Minister who wasn't there. And finally, I'm just going to add, at the end of this show, a recent 7.30 segment, which again, I think, provided a very well-balanced overview of the arguments and frankly, just underscores again how weird this whole episode has been. Remember, the watches were from a couple of years ago. It related specifically to a very successful negotiation that allowed funds to flow from the big banks to Australia Post to keep the local post offices going a bit longer. And it's also worth reflecting on what pressures might have been brought to bear from those big banks who hated the negotiation and the outcome. And, of course, the question of the future of Australia Post and whether it was likely to be privatised. Frankly, if money comes in and makes the Australia Post enterprise more profitable, the argument for privatisation goes away. There were a small number of senior people who'd put in an inordinate amount of work in, and they did receive an award from the chair, myself, and on behalf of the board. They were a Cartier watch of about value of $3,000 each. Four Cartier watches, presented as an example of fat cat largesse and what is known in politics as bad optics. Six months on, the outrage they provoked from the Prime Minister on the day seemed curiously out of whack with the scandals that have engulfed his government since. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. And it's not on. The chief executive wishes to stand aside. Well, not wishes to stand aside. She's been instructed to stand aside. And if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. Yes, the prime ministerial outrage was so high it was on the needles in the strawberry scale. But there were just two problems with all the outrage. The first was the backstory about the Cartier watches. The second was that the reputation of one of Australia's most successful businesswomen, Christine Holgate, 
was destroyed in a few minutes of outrage that has subsequently come to look badly misplaced. Angela Cramp runs two post offices in Wollongong. She is also one of thousands of local post office, or LPO operators, who are outraged at Christine Holgate's treatment. She convinced three major banks and up to 70 minor banks, second tier lenders, to actually invest in the LPO network and contribute $220 million worth of revenue over a five year period. It changed our payments, it paid our staff. It was groundbreaking. The four Australia Post executives who scored the Cartier watches had locked in a deal which saved around 3,000 community post offices across Australia. It is just atrocious. I want her reinstated. Holgate ultimately left Australia Post in hotly contested circumstances and has kept her counsel until now. But in an explosive 154-page submission to a Senate inquiry, the businesswoman has bluntly stated that Australia Post's chairman, Lucio de Bartolomeo, has lied to the Senate and that she was thrown under the bus by both Australia Post and the Morrison government. To be clear, the purchase of the four watches as a reward for the efforts of executives who delivered the pivotal bank at post deal was legal, within Australia Post policies, within my own signing authority limits, approved by the previous chairman, expensed appropriately and signed off by auditors and the CFO. It was then found to be legal by the review, which was clearly intended to find it otherwise. Yet somehow, I was forced out of my job over it. But also to reflect Holgate says she was stood down unlawfully on October 22, but that after, quote, the 10 most difficult and disappointing days of her career, the former Blackmore's chief executive offered to resign, but did not actually do so. Without responding to Holgate, Australia Post announced within hours that she had resigned. Her salary and emails were cut off. The matter is still unresolved. She says Mr Di Bartolomeo told the Senate she had agreed to stand down without evidence to substantiate this and despite considerable evidence that she did not agree to stand down. Holgate documents at length how she was abandoned by the two ministers responsible for Australia Post, Communications Minister Paul Fletcher and Finance Minister Simon Birmingham. But it is worth remembering who first claimed public credit for sacking her. Chief Executive wishes to stand aside. Well, not wishes to stand aside. She's been instructed to stand aside. And if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. By today, though, it seemed the Prime Minister was, as is so often the case, not the man responsible. This is a matter now that's substantively between Ms Holgate and, and Australia Post, and that's where I note that the predominance of her comments have been directed. Um, Ms Holgate decided to um, leave Australia Post. That's just a matter of record. It's quite clear to anybody watching on that there are two sets of rules, one for the boys club and one for women in politics. And sadly, um, what we see is that Ms Holgate was victim of that. So here you have it really important conversation, a really important set of questions to be asked on Tuesday, and I for one will be interested to see the final report that comes out at the end of April. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.